Good morning, everyone. How are we doing today? Good, good. My name's Dan, one of the pastors here. For those who might not know me, great to uh, see so many of you and some of you visiting for the, the first time in a while. Welcome back. Great to have you here. Uh, just to catch you up, if this is your first week, uh, we are now in week three of a series titled Cages. And what we're trying to do as we begin this new year together is to confront the cages in our own hearts that hold us back in our relationship with the Lord and hold us back in, um, in what he wants to do in and through our lives. The reality is we, we all have cages. We all have things that hinder us. Some of these things we're aware of. Some of them we're not. Uh, some of them we create ourselves. Some of them are a trap that we've fallen into. But all the same, we have these cages that tend to hinder us and hold us back. And so we want to take some time as we begin this year to really just press in uh, to the freedom that God has already purchased for us through sending his son to live a perfect life on our behalf, to die a perfect death in our place, and to be risen in resurrection power so that we might have the hope of eternal life with him. So Jesus has already purchased this freedom for us, but we often have to contend for it. We have to step into it. We have to recognize where we're lacking that freedom so that we can be unleashed into the freedom that Christ has for us. So that's where we're at. Um, and so we're going to um, go for it in a moment. But first, I have to hug Simon. You're just, your face is so beautiful. Welcome back, man. Welcome back. It's good to have you, man. Ooh, all right. <laughs> Welcome back. Anna, welcome back. Great to see you as well. So exciting. I'll hug you later. Okay. <clears throat> All right. As we begin, this is the thing that's been stirring in my heart this week, and I just want us to, to begin here, and then actually we'll begin with another moment of prayer. Um, but here's the idea. In this series, uh, we're going to teach on what God's Word says about these various cages. But the goal is not more information, because more information doesn't really change us. Right? Our, our goal is transformation. And that is the result, not of our own effort to get free. That is the result of the Spirit's work in our life. And I read this this week, and it's, it stayed with me. It's this simple statement that says, transformation begins with a radical reliance on the Spirit of God. Transformation begins with a radical reliance on the Spirit of God. And that is my hope for us, that we will encounter the freedom that he has for us through the work of his spirit in us. Not that we'll learn more, be more educated, but rather that we'll be transformed by the spirit's work in us. So if you're able, I'm going to ask you to get a little crazy this week. If you're able to get on your knees, I want to just begin in prayer in a posture of utter dependence on the Lord. If you can't, I know some of us have bad knees, no problem, stay where you are, but let's just get in a posture and let's just welcome the Holy Spirit to come now and do his work in us, if I could be so bold. Holy Spirit, we come before you in this moment. And we thank you, Lord, that you are in this place. And Lord, we just want to confess this morning together our complete and utter dependence on your spirit. Lord, we know we can't change ourselves. We can't uh, claim freedom that you haven't already purchased for us. So Lord, my prayer for us today is that we would bring our lives under the authority of your word, and that we would be transformed by the power of your presence. Lord, we welcome you in this place right now. We ask God that you would do a deep work in our hearts. Lord, we know that your work isn't always pleasant. Sometimes it's painful. But it produces a harvest of righteousness for those who yield to it. So our prayer today, Lord, is that we would yield to the work you want to do in us in this moment. We invite your spirit's power. We pray that your word might be unleashed, that it might pierce and penetrate our hearts so that we live in alignment with the truth of scripture. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We ask you to set us free. 
where your spirit is, there is freedom. And we recognize and invite and celebrate your spirit here with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you so much. If you have a Bible with you, we're going to look at a passage this morning in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 17. And I'm going to warn you, there's a lot of scripture today. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's okay, we're in church. All right. A lot of scripture, but here's what Paul writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians 4, 17. He says, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. You remember in week one, we talked about how the, one of the results of sin is hardness of hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, verse 19, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him, in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbors, for we are all members of one body. Pay attention to this here. In your anger, do not sin. In your anger, do not sin. And do not let the sun go down while you are still hang angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. We could linger there for a moment. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it might benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ forgave you. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Yeah. Now, this passage is packed with so much truth, and today, the cage that we are confronting is the cage of anger and bitterness. So again, we're going we're gonna to be nice and light this morning, just deal with some surface issues. But let me ask you this. Have any of you ever been wronged by someone and then found yourself seething with anger or bitterness? Anyone at all? Chances are, if you still have oxygen in your lungs and your heart is still beating, this is an issue for you. Right? Whether it's a, a, a minor slight or a major hurt, we have these moments when we find that we get stuck in a vicious cycle of anger and bitterness and resentment. Again, it can be small and it can be huge. It doesn't matter the, the size of it, but so often we find ourselves caught up in these cycles. Now, this is something that you, uh, some of you may not have much experience with. But in America, we have a little thing we like to call road rage. Anyone ever experienced this before? Yeah. Can I have permission to make some cultural observations for a moment? This is dangerous, but I like to ask permission. Something I've noticed since I've been here is that you guys, you Brits, are incredibly 
friendly, considerate, lovely drivers. I mean, honestly, it's sometimes baffling to me, right? You guys are so kind to one another in your car, in your car, okay? Like you could be coming down and there's like a gap, you know, there's like a gap between me and the next car and I can see that there's someone waiting to turn out of their driveway and, and get going on their way. So what am I gonna do as a Brit, as a good considerate driver? I'm gonna actually slow down and stop all the traffic behind me Flash my light so you know I am stopping for you. You can now go out. Please get in front of me and, and be on your way. And then, of course, if you're a good Brit, what I've learned is you have to give a little blink on the emergency flashers that says, thank you, thank you, right? Very happy you stopped to let me out. I want to say thank you, okay? Now, sometimes, hold on now, sometimes you let somebody out and they didn't flash you. Who's been angry about that before? And then you want to get up on their tail, right? Like, what is your problem? Why didn't you say thank you? I flashed you and let you out. You didn't thank me. Okay, this becomes problematic. Now, the Brits are great drivers. So you don't have a lot of road rage. In America, we're going to come to America in a moment. But the other thing that I've, I've noticed that feels like a paradox is you can be so friendly inside your car, but on the sidewalk... Where did the friendliness go? Right, you pass someone on the sidewalk, and sure, you're still going to be polite. You're going to let somebody have space to get around you, but don't you dare make eye contact with somebody. It's like a, a, a cultural taboo, it seems. An outsider looking in. You know, you walk past somebody, and where I come from, if you don't speak to someone you pass, it's really rude. But in, in England, it could be like this. You walk in, and somebody's coming, and all of a sudden, they're like, <laughs> right? Get your phone out. Pretend like you're looking at something so you don't have to make eye contact Right, or you do this, look away, or just look down. Where's the friendliness on the sidewalk that we have on the roads? Only in the south, okay, I need to go up north, I hear you. I have actually witnessed that, okay. Now, this is interesting to me because in America, we're the polar opposite. At least where I come from in the south of America. People are very friendly. We'll be the most gregarious, outgoing, friendly people face to face. In fact, you should have seen Becky when we first got married as a good Brit, and, and she came to, we have this store called Walmart. Anyone ever heard of a Walmart? It's like just a big department store. And we were checking out one time in our first year of marriage, and the lady ringing up our groceries started asking Becky how she was doing. And Becky looked at her like, what is wrong with you? I don't know you. Why are you asking me how I'm doing? Just ring up the groceries and mind your own business. Right? She didn't say that, but the look on her face was like, and we walked to the car. She's like, why was that lady asking me how my day's going? I'm like, because it's friendly. So, but that's weird. You know, it's a cultural difference. We'll be super friendly, but put us in a car and we are the biggest jerks in America you'll ever see. Like if there's a space between like me and you and you're trying to come out, I'm not going to slow down and flash my lights. I'm going to hit the gas and try to close that gap so you can't get in front of me. Why? Because if you are in front of me, think about it, I'm behind you. And if I'm behind you, I am now losing until I find a way to pass you and get back in front, back on top. All right, we're competitive. And, and that's, that's sometimes how it goes. Now, road rage is a, a little bit of a casual, lighthearted example, although sometimes it gets a little, little scary. But all joking aside, we, we get these slights as we go through our day. Whether it's someone not speaking to us when they pass us, or some American jerk face cutting you off in traffic, or, you know, something minor like that. And if we're not careful, those little slights inside of us can begin to fester. They can begin to ferment and create a little bit of anguish in our souls. And before we know it, there's a root of bitterness springing up and taking hold in our hearts. Now, a small slight, most of us are mature enough to deal with those. But what about the major hurts? Perhaps you're here this morning and, and you've had a friend that has absolutely betrayed your trust and left you feeling vulnerable and exposed. Maybe, maybe someone that you know and love misunderstood something you said took your words out of context and began to, to say things that might 
uh, hurt you, they assume the worst, and they begin to ridicule you and slander you, and, and character assassination begins to happen. Maybe you're here today, and you've had a spouse who cheated on you, and it not only broke your heart, it fractured your marriage, and you're not sure how to get past it. Maybe someone has physically hurt you or abused someone that you love, and you find your heart just absolutely seething with anger, waiting for your moment when you can exact some revenge and some divine retribution. I'm talking Old Testament biblical-style revenge, right? Because someone has hurt you, and you've carried that pain for so long. There are a myriad of ways that we can be hurt. Living in a broken, fallen world, doing life with broken, fallen people, we are bound to suffer some, some wounds. And if we're not careful and attentive to those moments, those wounds can become bitterness that begins to poison our hearts and consume our souls. I'm sure you found this as I have, that bitterness is often a slow burn, right? It, it doesn't just suddenly happen. It's, it's one negative interaction leads to another, and then you have a negative thought that leads to another. And next thing you know, you're tossing and turning at night, replaying these hurtful interactions in your mind, having imaginary conversations with this person in your head as you make a diabolical plan to get even. We've all been there. We've all had these moments. Gregory Propak once said that bitterness is unforgiveness fermented. All right, bitterness is unforgiveness that's been fermented. Left to fester, what begins as righteous anger can eventually become a corrosive um, ulcer that leads to bitterness. In fact, there was a doctor who said this, Stephen Diamond, PhD, defines bitterness, medically speaking, as this, a chronic and pervasive state of smoldering resentment. Again, a chronic and pervasive state of smoldering resentment. And he regards it as one of the most destructive and toxic of all human emotions. If, he goes on to say, if we repeatedly ruminate on how we've been victimized, nursing our wrongs may come to define an essential part of who we are. And that then takes on a, a very strong hold in our personality. And he said this, we'll end up becoming victims, not so much of anyone else, but we become victims of our own thinking. Left unattended, our hurts quickly become our identity. Think about that for a moment. If we don't take the time to deal with the bitterness in our hearts, we soon begin to identify with that bitterness, and it comes to define who we are. It becomes part of our identity. What begins with the pain we carry can easily become a victim mentality that we embrace. Bitterness always exacts a high price from the one who carries it. Okay, bitterness exacts a high price from the one who carries it. In an article in Psychology Today, Dr. Leon Seltzer uh, had this to say about the effects of bitterness. And I just want to rattle through a few of these real quick. What happens when we hold on to bitterness is it prolongs our mental and emotional pain and often even exasperates it. Holding on to bitterness can lead to long-lasting anxiety and depression. Clinging to our bitterness can precipitate vengeful acts that put you further at risk of being victimized again and can engulf you in a never-ending, self-defeating cycle of trying to get even. Bitterness can prevent you from experiencing the potential joy of living fully present in the moment because you remain hung up in the past. 
it can create or deepen an attitude of distrust and cynicism that contributes to hostility and paranoid thinking and eventually leads to pessimism. Such a bleak perspective prompts others to turn away from you. So it hinders your future relationships. He goes on and says it interferes with cultivating healthy and satisfying relationships that can lead you to doubt or disparage your connection to other people. It can compromise and weaken your higher ideals and adversely impact your personal search for purpose and meaning in life. Not only that, but it can undermine your physical health. Chronic anger and bitterness raises the baseline of your stress and taxes your immune system, medically speaking and keeping you in this paradoxical state of vengeful bondage is a word he uses. Vengeful bondage. It erodes your sense of well-being. And this doctor finishes this article, uh, not in a Christian magazine, but in Psychology Today, with this question. Do you really want to continue to see yourself as a victim with all the implications and helplessness embedded in that defeatist mindset? That's a pretty powerful question, isn't it? It makes us think about the bitterness we carry. At the end of the day, bitterness, I believe, is the result of not getting what we believe we deserve. Okay, think about that. Bitterness is the result of not getting what we believe we deserve. It's a byproduct of not getting what we want. You see, when you're angry at someone, anger essentially says this, you owe me. You have done something to wrong me, and because you have wronged me, you now owe me for the wrong that you've done to me. And the angry, bitter person carries around that, that belief that they need to be repaid for the way that they were wronged. And it essentially creates a debt debtor relationship. Because you wronged me, you are now in debt to me for the wrong that you've inflicted on me. And I'm going to keep you in an emotional chokehold until you can pay me back. And it begins to strangle our relationships. And it begins to lock us in a cage of resentment, in a cage of anger, in a prison of bitterness. A heart filled with anger is a heart that's looking to be paid back. It's a heart that's looking for retribution. It's a heart that's seeking to collect on the debt that is owed to them. To cling to our hurt while we wait to be repaid is to allow the seeds of bitterness to take root in our hearts. Let me say that one more time. To cling to our hurt while we're waiting to be repaid is to allow the seed of bitterness to take root in our heart. And the author of Hebrews speaks directly to this. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 to 15, the author says this. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and be holy. Okay, let's put that on our to-do list for this week. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And then check this out, verse 15. He says, see to it. There's an active, uh, aggressive, pay attention to this, make sure of this, be convinced of this, do everything within your power to make this come to pass. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. And that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. You see, when we don't tend to the bitterness in our heart, it takes root. And when that root springs up, it will cause trouble in your life. It will defile every relationship you have. If you let that bitterness go unchecked, it will consume you and imprison you in a cage of anger and resentment. 
See, bitterness, even when we don't want to admit it, is often a cage we create. Now, things have been done to us that are wrong. I'm not underplaying that. But at the end of the day, if you find yourself caught in a vicious cycle of anger and bitterness, you're in a cage that you've created. Not because of something you've done, but because of something you failed to do. And we'll look at what that is in just a moment. True freedom and joy are found by embracing the gospel of grace and extending the grace of God to the very people that we are least inclined to love. The cure for bitterness is not found in getting even. The cure for bitterness is found in giving grace. The cure is extending forgiveness. You see, for each of these cages we're looking at, we're also talking about the key that leads to freedom. And so when it comes to this key, this cage of anger and bitterness and resentment, the key that will lead to your freedom is extending forgiveness to others. In that passage we read at the beginning in Ephesians 4, verses 31 and 32, Paul says that forgiveness is essentially the way that we get rid of bitterness. It's the way that we get rid of anger and rage and malice and brawling. It enables us to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ and God forgave us. What is forgiveness? If you boil it down to its very basic fundamental level, forgiveness is the decision to cancel the debt that someone else owes you. All right? If anger says you owe me, forgiveness is my choice to cancel that debt and to say to you from one forgiven person to another, you don't owe me anymore. I extend forgiveness and I am free. Because very often, think about it, the debts that we cling to are often debts that cannot be repaid anyways. If we hold out waiting to be paid back for the wrongs done to us, ultimately it's you and I who pay the steepest price. But when we extend forgiveness to someone else, we discover that it wasn't that person we set free, it's ourselves. We've set ourselves free by extending forgiveness to others. When we forgive someone, we are surrendering our right to be paid back. And I know it's not fair. I'm not even saying that the person deserves to be forgiven. Most likely, I'm on your side, I'm with you, they don't, okay? They don't deserve forgiveness. But it's not a question about if they deserve it. It's a question of what does Jesus ask us to do? When we harbor bitterness, when we hold on to our anger, it's like drinking a cup of poison and hoping that it kills the other person. In fact, that word bitterness in Hebrews 12 has the connotation of a poison, something that is poisonous. So when we cling to that bitterness, it's like drinking poison and hoping that it kills someone else. But forgiveness is the gift that God gives us that enables us to be free from the cage of bitterness and resentment. So how do we do it? How do we forgive someone who has wronged us? How do we forgive someone who has really violated our trust and has hurt us in some way? How do we find the strength to cancel the debt that they owe us? At the risk of oversimplification, I would say this. Think of what was done for you, not what was done to you. Think of what was done for you, not what was done to you. Think about what Jesus has forgiven you from. You don't forgive because the other person deserves it. We forgive simply because we have been forgiven. And only by resting in the streams of God's abundant grace for ourselves do we ever find the strength to extend his forgiveness to others. 
Only by having a revelation and an experience of his grace will enable us and empower us to give that grace to others. We don't forgive because they deserve it. We forgive because we've been forgiven. Let me read you one more parable here uh, from Matthew chapter 18. It's a, it's a very familiar parable. Many of you will have read this many times. And it's a little bit long, but it really ties into what we're saying. So I want to take time and, and just read from God's word and invite his word to once again speak to our own hearts here. It's the parable of the unmerciful servant. In Matthew 18, 21, it says this. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? You see, Peter was feeling holy. Like, what if I forgive them seven times? That's got to that's give me some, some street cred with you, Jesus. And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him and pleaded with him, be patient with me and I will pay back everything. And the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. And he grabbed him and began to choke him. How many of you know that's what unforgiveness looks like? It's having a stranglehold on someone else's throat. And he demanded, pay back what you owe me. Again, there's that concept of a debt, debtor relationship. Pay back what you owe me. And his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what happened, when the other servants saw what happened, they were outraged and they went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in and said, you wicked servant, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have also had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and sister from your heart. I won't insult your intelligence by explaining this to you. Right, we, we get it. We can easily understand Jesus' point. But if we're honest, it's a lot easier to understand the teaching of Jesus than it is to live the way of Jesus. We can understand his teachings, but living in the pattern of Christ is a little more difficult. See, forgiveness is a mindset. It's, a, it's an attitude. It's a, it's a holy habit that we cultivate as we practice the way of Jesus. And we must be careful that we don't settle for merely believing what Jesus said. Because we don't want to just believe what he said. We want to live how he lived. The goal of our journey with Christ is that we would cultivate Christ-likeness by abiding in him. By resting in the power of his spirit who is at work within us. We want to see our lives be transformed. And again, we don't forgive because they deserve it. We forgive because we've been forgiven. Paul says this in Colossians 2, actually, in verses 13 and 14, that he took the, the debt, the legal debt that was against us, and he canceled it by nailing it to the cross. Again, Jesus canceled our debt and now instructs us that we too should cancel the debt that other people owe us. That is what forgiveness looks like. You see, 
we talk about discipleship, our hope, our prayer is not that we'll just be a church, but that we'll be a disciple-making community that we will grow in our adoration and affection for Christ, and that we will increasingly bring our lives into alignment with his word, into congruence with how he lived his life. See, very often in the Western church in particular, we think of discipleship as a data dump. If I could just transfer the information that I've studied into your brain, then you'll be more like Jesus. Jesus. But how many of you know and would acknowledge most of us are educated well beyond our level of obedience? Can I get an amen? Most of us are educated well beyond our level of obedience. So if we want to experience the life of Jesus, we must adapt the lifestyle of Jesus. All right? If we want to experience his life, then we must adapt his lifestyle. So here's the opportunity. Every time somebody wrongs you, every time somebody hurts you, every time someone takes advantage of you or slanders you or mistreats you, we have an opportunity to practice the way of Jesus. We have an opportunity to extend grace to those who who may not deserve it. But we can do it because we have received his grace. And therefore, his spirit empowers us to extend his grace. Again, only as we bask in the abundance of God's grace for us will we find the grace to forgive others. So now that I've done my intro, let me give you my four-point sermon. No, I'm kidding. Four quick points. How do you extend forgiveness to someone else? The first thing you need to do is identify who you are angry with. You need to name the person who's wronged you. In your own heart, in your mind, you need to identify um, what it is that they have done. Number two, you need to determine what they owe you. Right? We know that we've been wronged by someone, we've been hurt by someone, we've been mistreated by someone, but what is it that we think they owe us? What is the debt that we're waiting to collect? Determine what they are. Listen, general forgiveness does not heal specific hurts. We need to be specific in the forgiveness we extend. So identify what is it that this person owes you. Number three, and this is the fun part, cancel the debt. Once you identify who's wronged you and you've determined what they owe you, then you make an intelligent, willful decision to cancel their debt. And are you going to feel good afterwards? Not necessarily. Forgiveness isn't a feeling. It's a choice. It's a choice to cancel the debt against you. In doing so, you set yourself free from this cage of bitterness. And finally, this is where it gets a little harder. Not only do you have to cancel the debt, but then you have to dismiss the case. Case closed. What does that mean? That means from one forgiven soul to another, you no longer owe me. I've canceled the debt that you have. I've forgiven you, and I am free now. I am free from this. And choosing not to reopen the case will sometimes be a daily decision. Our feelings are often the last thing to catch up with our decision to forgive. So don't let the enemy discourage you when you don't feel any different. It's not about how you feel. It's about the decision you made. And when those feelings come back up, we simply remind ourselves, no, 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 no. I've canceled this debt. I've dismissed this case. This is done and dealt with, and I am free. When your memories are triggered, feelings, angry feelings will come flooding back. Okay? I just want you to know that's going to happen. You make the decision to forgive doesn't mean you're not going to feel those feelings again. 
We need to learn to expect those feelings so we're not blindsided by them. I know even in choosing to extend forgiveness, there's going to be something that triggers me. It makes me angry all over again. And then what I'm going to do is remind myself that I've canceled the debt and I've dismissed the case. I've extended forgiveness to this person. When those feelings come, face them. Don't ignore them. Don't deny them. Don't stuff them. Deal with them. Name them. And don't let them have a chokehold on your life anymore. Focus on the truth. This debt has been forgiven. From one forgiven person to another, you don't owe me anything anymore. I want to invite Izzy and the band to come back up and we're going to take some moment to just respond to God's word today. And here's what we know. This isn't an easy topic. This is a challenging thing to think about. And chances are, many of us in this room have been holding on to some sort of anger or bitterness or resentment for a long time. When you came in, or actually in the, in the break, hopefully you were given a rock. And this rock just represents the bitterness that you've carried. It represents the anger that you carried. It represents the resentment that has marked your life. And this morning, I simply want to invite you to make a choice. Listen, it's your choice. You can choose to keep carrying your anger. You can choose to cling to your unforgiveness. You can choose, hold, choose to hold on to that resentment. Or you can choose to lay it down. You can choose to cancel the debt that is owed you. You can choose to say, you know what? This isn't the boss of me anymore. I might have carried this for 50 years. But today I make a decision that it will no longer control me. By the grace and the power of Christ, I choose to lay it down. I choose to surrender my right to be paid back. Lord, I give it to you. I cancel the debt. I dismiss the case. And I am now free from this cage that has imprisoned me. Look, I don't want to underplay. I know sometimes some people have been seriously hurt and seriously wronged. And there are times when we need counseling. There are times when we need therapy. I don't want to oversimplify this and say it's just as simple as lay it down. Sometimes you then have to work out the decision you've made. Sometimes you might need uh, medication and treatment, therapy. Get the help that you need. But it starts right here. It starts with the decision to lay it down. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3.17, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And the freedom of Christ reigns in this place. It's his mercy. It's his grace that enables us to lay down the things we've carried. So very simply this morning, I'm going to invite you if there's something you need to lay down, if there's some anger you've been carrying, some bitterness, some resentment, maybe from a small slight, maybe from a major hurt, but if there's something you need to surrender, I want to invite you as Izzy begins to sing over us to come and bring your rock and just lay it on the table at the front. And when you lay it, make it a prayerful moment. Lord, help me to forgive even as you have forgiven me. Lord, I don't feel like it. I don't even want to do it if I'm honest. But I'm going to focus on what you did for me, not on what was done to me. And I'm going to lay this down. And I want you just to say, I cancel the debt. I extend forgiveness to this person. Just between you and the Lord, 
leave it. And then when you walk back to your seat, empty handed, let that be a reminder that you are no longer imprisoned in this cage, but you have walked into the freedom that Christ purchased you by extending forgiveness and grace through the power of his spirit. Maybe you're here and you don't have anything. Pray for the rest of us. I invite you to pray for us. If you don't have anything, you don't have to make something up. If that's you, don't carry the rock out of it. Just throw it under your chair. Okay, you're good. But if you need to deal with it, let's get out of our seats today and let's deal with the anger and the bitterness and the resentment that has held us back. So Lord, we pray right now in this moment that you, Lord, would help us to lay down our anger, our bitterness, and our resentment. Give us strength by the power of your spirit. We invite you, Lord, in this moment to set us free, to transform our hearts, and to lead us into your perfect freedom. Take your time as Izzy sings over us, and when you're ready, I encourage you to take that bold step. And I want to invite our prayer team to come and be at the front as well. You might need help. You might need someone to pray with you, pray for you. Maybe even before you lay your rock down, you said, I need, I need someone to agree with me in prayer first. Our prayer team will be here to do that. Or if you lay your rock down and then you want prayer, just, just know that we're here for this or for it, prayer, any general prayer you need. We're going to make time for that. But let us deal with our hearts now so that we might experience the freedom and transformation of Christ.